Welcome to Ear Biscuits, a podcast where two lifelong friends talk about life for a long time. I'm Link. And I'm Red. This week at the round table of dim lighting, we're going to be talking about our relationship to Christmas and how it has evolved over time as we've evolved as people. Yeah, it's um it's it's an interesting touch point. It's it's interesting for me. This is kind of an exercise of looking through the lens of Christmas and seeing my former self maybe in different stages and then my current self. Is that that's that's how you see this going? Yeah, I mean, you know, this conversation, I mean. Talking about yeah, Lord just life. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think I, I want to talk about the way that I used to think about Christmas, um, and then as I was sort of transitioning out of personally considering myself a Christian, like what that was like, and then what it's like today, um, and how that and, and how that continues to be in process. Yeah, who I, this is going to be interesting. Who knows where this is going to go? Uh, one one quick thing before we move on, though. Is it a podcast where two lifelong friends, or is it the podcast where two lifelong friends? I don't listen to any other ones with two lifelong friends talk about life for a long time. Because I think I've been saying the, but I could have sworn you said uh. Oh, did I? Okay. I'd like to retract my uh and replace it with the the. I don't. It was very quick. You you swallowed it a little bit. I didn't really know. So I didn't. I mean, but I want. But you made me think. Hold on. Is it uh or the? What have I been saying? I think I've been saying the. We'll have to go to the tape. Do we want to say the? Let's say the. The. I might say the. I reserve the right to say the. Here, back to Christmas. I mean, this year in particular and this approaching holiday season, I mean, yes, we're gonna be talking about Christmas and there's gonna I'm be- I'm sorry a- to interrupt you, but you've said two phrases that make me think of Christmas movies. You said the lens of Christmas, and I was like, that would be a good Christmas movie. And then you said back to Christmas, and I was thinking about a future, like a future, like a time travel movie. Back to, to the go, future you to, Christmas you edition? You have to go back to Christmas for something. I really okay. wanna make a Christmas movie, man. We should make a Christmas movie. Well, the idea we came up with for a Christmas movie, it just didn't, it didn't yeah. come together. What was that idea? It was called, um, it was it was about a gift. It was about a gift that you it was a husband got a gift for his wife. He wanted to get her the perfect gift. It's called the perfect gift. Yes. And it I still think it's a I think we could update the idea and still make it. I don't think it was a horrible idea. And we had a we had a role for Jeff Goldblum. Remember that? Yeah, he was not that he, he would have he, ever said yes. Well, no, he was attached. <laughs> I want to make a Christmas movie, man. Because I, even I was, you know, I got to make a wreck later on, and I was like, I'm going to wreck sort of like an under the radar Christmas movie. I got a great recommendation for a Christmas movie. It's my favorite movie of all time. Yeah, we know Elf, and uh, so I'm not going to steal that. But I'm not going to recommend a Christmas movie because there's just not. I mean, it's hard to find the ones that are good. When you end up going very, really quickly to Die Hard as a Christmas movie, which it's not a Christmas movie, it just takes place at Christmas. It just shows you. There just haven't been enough good Christmas movies made. Uh, I, we could give it another shot. Come up with something else or tweak that one. And and just another aside about Jeff Goldblum. Uh, I think this was something that I just read on Reddit as I was falling asleep. Jeff Gold, Goldblum has this practice. Whenever he meets somebody uh, at a party, well the way it was described was in a tweet from somebody who was semi-famous, like a journalist and who would mingle at parties and he would know some people at parties but he was introduced to Jeff Goldblum for the first time and 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 the guy was introduced to Jeff Goldblum. Jeff Goldblum's first response was, oh my God, of course. <laughs> and it makes you feel important. And he felt, and he was like, I just didn't know how but I guess Jeff Goldblum had read one of my articles or something, you know? He seemed to know me, but then I happened to hear him being introduced to other people at the party, and every time he would say, "Oh my God, of course!" <laughs> <laughs> you gotta love that, man. Yeah, I mean, it's a little manipulative, but it makes you it's feel smart. good. It's smart. It makes you feel good. Yeah. People want to be important. If you're, and I thought about maybe I should do that or come up with my own version of that, and I then I'm like, you know what? You, you have need... to be Jeff Goldblum. Well, I just think you have to change it. 
You have to be Jeff Goldblum. Not only change it from what he says. Oh my God, of course. But you have to change it. Um, maybe that was just that night. Maybe when he's looking at himself, looking at himself in the mirror before he goes out, he's like, "What is it tonight?" Oh my God, of course. And then he goes. With well, one, I think once you land on that one, you realize it is the holy grail of introduction and responses. If you, if you're Jeff Goldblum, if you, I mean, or someone else who. Everybody at a party wants to talk to. Like, not, he's not even just because he's a celebrity, because he's that, he's that, he's that, he's Jeff Goldblum. What about, yes, finally? <laughs> I mean, that. Been waiting to meet you. You know, that has. No, that doesn't work because if you've already met the person, it doesn't work. Uh -huh. yeah. I yes. mean, oh my God, of course, is the, is the best, but I'm just saying, I don't wanna, you don't wanna overuse it. Back to Christmas. Sorry, you were saying something. Uh, Christmas this year, along with everything else this year, is is strained and strange. You, you know, it's just a lot of traditions are having to be altered because the holiday season is, is, is the time of tradition. But everything's, you know, everything's got to change. At least for me and my household, we will not be going home for Thanksgiving or Christmas. I actually think by the time this comes out, Thanksgiving has already happened. Yeah, it has. Uh, and I did not go home. Yeah. And I'm not going home for the, uh, the Christmas holidays or New Year's or any of that stuff. Uh, and it's, you know, it's sad. So I'm, I'm mourning the, the ability to do that. I am really relieved that my extended family understands and actually w even before we told them, I kind of felt like, are we breaking the news to them that we're not coming home? So, but when we had the discussions, it was like, oh yeah, we already knew that you guys weren't going to be able to come home. It's just, yeah, you know, I don't want to get into what the what the what the COVID numbers are like now versus in a couple of weeks from now. Well, but they'll be higher in a couple of weeks. Oh, gosh. <laughs> but it's, I mean, it was, it's know, heading it's, in the wrong direction. Right I've now. got loved ones that I want to protect, and I just can't have. I I can't be the one that increases their 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 risk. I, Listen, I just can't have I, that on I, my I, conscience. I don't necessarily want to go here, but I will go here because uh, I know people feel differently about this. But it is just a fact, an indisputable fact, that some people this holiday season will get on a plane, go across the country to be with their loved ones, and someone will die because of that. I, I, I you know, it's, it, it's. I'm not saying right. I, I'm, I'm just saying that it's a fact. That's going to happen. You can do with that what you will. And so for, for me, it's like I can't. That can't be on I, me. I don't want to be a part of that. You know, I think next year is going to be different. I think we're going to be through this. I'm really. But I don't want to. I don't want. I don't want the risk. I'm just really glad that that they were expecting it. They were on the same page. They were understanding. I mean, that doesn't mean it's not. It's not going to be sad, and it's it's going to hurt. You know, when New Year's rolls around and we still haven't seen anybody, you know, um, it's gonna hurt. But but that's our plan. The last two years, I actually think this will be the third year. Yeah. So the last two years, because you've been going home we, for Thanksgiving, we've been going home for Thanksgiving and not Christmas because we had and I discussed this in this venue. We had made a point that you know what we want to start forging our own. Swords traditions here in, in 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 our home base, so that you know I I've really started to look forward to what what when my kids are coming back home for the holidays to to me and Christy and then you know hopefully at one point we got grandkids coming in it's like you know I, we want our home that we set up and the traditions that we have to be the focal point of of this next layer of tradition, you know? If we if you keep going home, it kind of stalls things out, and that's kind of the decision we made. So we give them Thanksgiving, and then we don't give them Christmas, at least until we can establish something. And that actually is part of the complexion of this conversation, I think, is this being the third year, we've got these COVID complications and limitations, but still, the Neal family, we're trying to forge what what Christmas looks like for us um, in California, because you know traditions and, and and habits and expectations aren't formed in just a year or two, and we're only in year three, so we're we're still trying to figure all that out. And then you factor in everything that, yeah, you were talking about, just in terms of like where where I'm at spiritually, uh, that journey, and how all of that really seems to come into sharp focus 
around Christmas for for obvious Jesus as a baby reasons. Would you say that uh, you hone in on that, those things? Did I say home? No, I'm just saying that you said sharp focus. And, you're, uh, you're 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 really the uh, the verbiage police today. No, the, the uh, uh, you didn't say anything. I'm just it's a throwback. It's a throwback oh, to our conversation. I thought I said you did not say home. I thought I said either. Way. Um, yeah, and this and this Christmas is going to be uh, especially interesting because we're going to spend it together, uh, which we have not done. You're talking about us now, me and you. Uh, as families, we will be spending. You know, I, I'm not saying that we're necessarily going to get together on Christmas Day, but we, we haven't made plans. We yet, don't know yeah, exactly what the ins and outs of this are, but the family that my family is going to see is your family, right? And so, and I, we haven't done that before because we typically do go home to North yep. Carolina for Christmas and have the traditions that we do with my family and then with Jesse's family. That all they all kind of live really close to one another, and they do. You know, obviously they want us to come back, but they also probably know that, <laughs> given our disposition uh, when it comes to the pandemic, that we will not be. And um, yeah, so this is gonna it's gonna be strange because we haven't we we don't have these traditions that we've done as a family on our own. There's only been one Christmas in all of our time in California where we didn't go home. And you know, it's like Jesse's birthday is a week before Christmas. And then what we typically would do, we would celebrate her birthday and then like that weekend before Christmas, usually get on the plane, go to North Carolina. So being here for the whole time. And then also usually we tack on like a trip for ourselves as a family after we get done with the Christmas and the New Year stuff, like right at the beginning of the year. And you've done this as well. It might just be me and Jesse going somewhere together like for a few days. But none of that's gonna happen. There's just gonna be a whole lot of being at home through this whole time, and I really don't know how to prepare for it. We'll make the best of it. At least we, at least we do have, you know, our, our families that we, we've we're in this quarantine pod situation, and that that helps. And then our friend Mike and his family, we're you know we're we're gearing up. To make sure that like we're in a, we're in a safe situation to pod up with them, I think I'm pretty sure they'll be here for the holidays, yeah. and so it'll be uh, like our three families. Yeah, so uh, I think it'll be a good time being being. I, I'm together. looking forward. Oh, to it'll it, be but, a good time. But we've got to kind of invent our. I mean, first of all, I'm very excited about uh, the food, of course, and I want to play an integral part in the preparation of the food. I've got several ideas. Oh yeah. Um, that I'll actually get into when I do my rec later on. But um, I plan to feed you, is what I'm saying ultimately. And um, I, I could still c contribute music on a playlist. Yeah, you can have a playlist. You had a great playlist the other night. That, that worked, right? Yeah. You know, I was able to, you know, whenever something needed to be said, important, I was able, I, I stopped the music. Yeah. And then when it was over, I started the music back. And then people were like, oh, I like this song. You know, it's like, it's, it's, it means it's a little too loud. Can you turn it down? Oh, sure. sure. And while I was outside frying up that chicken for the uh, the hot, the Nashville hot chicken sandwiches, I was listening to the music outside as well. I had it pumping outside. So I was hearing the playlist just by myself. And I was kind of kind of I bopping. was kind of moving a little bit. You're kind of moving? And yeah. Mike uh, brought me a couple of drinks, which made it, it made everything better. Yeah. Um, there you go. So I, you know, we all have our part to play. Um. Okay. Well, now I'm just thinking about might that. Might dress, you know, might dress up like Santa. Might maybe could get. I don't know. Somebody could dress up like Santa. No, well, I kind of. We could do a nativity scene. I feel like in our in our pod that you know Mike is probably the. He's got the whitest beard. He got the whitest beard. Uh, we got this. We'll talk about La it. Last Why don't year, you be an elf. Last year, when you guys weren't That's here, what you like so much with my. I'll do it with Mike and uh, Mike's family. And Jenny, we um, we got matching Christmas pajamas. We all wore matching Christmas pajamas. Well, is that happening again? Uh, it should. Do I have to buy the same pair that you already have, or are we going all new? Uh, I'd like to just reuse what I have, but I haven't thought about it. Okay. You got to see if you can acquire it. I guess something that's a close approximation, but a little bit better. But is there going to be a nativity scene? Are we going to have like a like a little baby Jesus? Are we gonna have like goats and sheep? You know, back home there was, 
you you'd go by you drive by a church and they would have built this like three sided sh- shack made out of like pallet wood and then there'd be people dressed up like Mary Joseph and a baby Do, and there'd be a freaking hold on you've been a part of a live nativity with me I've not been a part of a live nativity like been in it as a ch- as a as a youth group very very hold young on. you weren't you Joseph. I could have sworn that you I were Joseph, Joseph and I was a shepherd. I may have been Joseph one year early on, yeah. Yeah, it was cold. I just remember it was cold. And I was like, man, I just got on like. I don't remember. I don't have I, enough clothes on. I thought it was inside. See, I'm not even remembering this right. There was a live nativity of at Bowie's Creek First Baptist Church that the youth did. And Maria Matthews was Mary. I think that was a play and it was inside. There was like a Christmas cantata. Okay, well, I could have sworn there was a live nativity. There was no, it, there was not a real baby though. I haven't done it as an adult because now I would be a, an amazing shepherd with my beard. You're too tall. Can't you? No, no, no. I'm too tall for Joseph. Let's get let's get real here. I'm too tall for Joseph. That would be a distraction. But having one tall ass shepherd or one tall ass wise, wise man, man, I think you'd be a wise man because they're 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 walking from a long distance. They're following yeah, that wise star. Man, I want to be the one with the frankincense and. And if you want to be or right I about it, I want to be the merman. <laughs> the uh, the uh, the the wise man is not going to show up for like years, right? Um, he didn't show up that when the baby was born. Well, I, now you're getting into some of the maybe. What, let's some let's some of the complex questions around the let's historicity come, of the nativity story. Let's come back. Which to we'll, this. we'll talk about in a second. <laughs> let's come back to this. Uh, we'll talk about all that, but first, we do want to let you know that whether you're traveling or not this Christmas. You can get a travel mug. Look at this thing. From mythical.com. It's tall, it's cylindrical, it fits in any cup holder in your car and travels with you. Y- you know, you might get excited about a travel mug mm-hmm. and you you wait for it to show up, you unbox it, you wash it, or maybe you just put your beverage in it and you're like, screw it, I'm just gonna drink it. That's my version of washing it. And then you put it in your car and it won't fit in your cup holder. Not with this one. Big fail. This thing will fit, it's tall, it's got a nice, um, secure top on it that 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 pops open, and it pops open in a way that you don't have to touch the place where your lips go. And it pops open in a way that it doesn't um, hit you in the nose when you drink it. Yep, see that? We thought through all this. See that? It's nice. Now the, it's hard to read what it says, but it says Good Mythical Morning. But you knew that anyway. With Rhett and Link. And maybe you like it that way. I like it that way. Mythical.com. Get yourself a travel mug, even if you can't travel. Um, okay, Christmas. I kind of, I sort of see this. Um, Christmas. I kind of see this as there, for me, and I, I mean, I think for you as well, just because we you've been on really similar journeys. I mean, there's there's some different stages, and of course, the first stage is what Christmas is like when you are a Christian. Let, let's roll out. Just go. If you have an idea of stages, just. Get roll out the stages just so we. I know where you're going. Okay, stage one is Christmas when you're a Christian, and and when I say Christian, I mean a Bible believing, in our case, evangelical Christian that takes the Christmas story 100% literal truth. Um, that's stage one. Stage two is a is a Christian who is struggling with doubt, engaging with Christmas. Stage three is someone who would no longer call themselves a Christian engaging with Christmas. And you might think, isn't that the all three stages? I think for me, there's a fourth stage, which is. Well, but and you can maybe be suspenseful about that. There's a fourth, not, there's a fourth stage. Okay. I'm not gonna say, yeah, I'm just gonna say it's the way that I am hoping to engage with Christmas now. Mm, I'm which very, may be surprising. I'm very interested in this, you know, I think in anticipation of this conversation, a number of thoughts come up for me, some of which I don't wanna process here, honestly, because I, d- I don't want this to be the first place that I process this type of thing because it implies inviting people to uh, to weigh in or, or help me figure things out for myself and I just, you know, I'm making the decision that I'm trying to put some boundaries on what I'm processing publicly and privately uh, and so some of that's coming up here, um, but I'm, but I'm still very excited 
to, to talk about this. And you know, we, we, tend to, we tend to approach these type of things and think about them in different ways. If you look back at our deconstruction stories, uh, they're, they're, they're unique to, to each of us in the way that, um, that we've, we've grappled with our faith and that we've moved forward in our journeys. Uh, I take great comfort in the fact that we, that we are moving forward in our journeys and that we have different approaches. I really enjoy the fact that like, like I haven't thought about these stages that you just mentioned, so I'm kinda, um, but I have my own thoughts that I'll, I'll pepper in there and might choose to keep my mouth shut at other times, but we'll see, we'll see how it plays out. And I do, you know, anytime we talk about, and we are, you know, we, we talk about spiritual things more freely since breaking the seal with our conversation earlier in the year about our spiritual deconstruction. Um, and these are sensitive topics that mean a lot to a lot of people. People hold these things very near and dear to their hearts for obvious reasons. And so just disclaimer, as we talk about these things, I just wanna be very clear that nothing that I'm gonna say, uh, or I'll speak for Link as well, is meant to be prescriptive. This is not advice. This isn't how we think you should approach Christmas. This isn't what we think is right for you. This is our process. This is just our personal story of what it was like at those different stages. Um, We're pro- I you mean, may relate to some of it, you may not. You may disagree with some of the conclusions. I, that's, I'm not trying to, to get you to come to a different conclusion. It's just, this is our story. That applies to every conversation we have here, but with a sensitive topic like this, I'm glad that yeah, you I said feel it. like because I, it's like we're, we're we're literally just processing the, our lives in this venue. Well, sometimes we do give prescriptive advice to people if they if they ask for it. Sometimes if they don't ask for it, but it's usually about things that don't really matter. <laughs> if, right, that's, if that's we when can, we feel most comfortable. If we can help it. Um, so, so we're gonna stay a little cagey yeah, today. So, but, but, but honest. Okay, so again, yeah. For what is probably still remains to be the majority of of the life that I've lived so far, I was uh, an evangelical Christian, you know, someone who believes that the Bible is the inerrant, that means without error, word of God. And so that means that the Christmas story itself, um, you know, of God taking the form of a baby, human, uh, of, of of a virgin becoming pregnant with that baby human, and that baby human being God himself and also God's son in the form of Jesus coming to the earth to offer a, a pathway of, of reconciling people to God. That's what we thought and we thought uh, that's what Christmas is for an evangelical Christian. It is the story of Jesus' birth. And is it Jesus's or is it Jesus' birth? I've heard pastors say it both ways. Don't, don't get hung up. I'm gonna say Jesus's just because I, you can tell that I'm saying that it's possessive. The story of Jesus's birth. Um, and I think it's, it's just an interesting thing in, in our culture, in America, I, I guess this happens in other places, but you know, there's like this long standing thing that happens between like during the, there's the Merry Christmas people and there's the Happy Holidays people and there's like this battle line that's drawn and like people get mad at Starbucks if they don't say Merry Christmas or whatever, right? And mm-hmm. this is a relatively recent sort of cultural battle, but I remember uh, what I can relate to about this is I remember as a Christian, and listen, a Christian who was like working for a Christian organization full time, like taking it very seriously, I always thought that this little cultural infighting about the whole Merry Christmas thing, I was like, why are y'all getting so upset about this? Yeah, I, I mean. Never, I didn't, re- I've never related to it. I think another way that we might have put it was, cause I agree that that was my assessment at the time, it's like, this is not a good look. This is not, this yeah. is not the fight. What, what, this is not the battle that what, we should yeah, be what, fighting. What is your desired outcome from this battle? That, uh, that you know? some atheist somewhere would say, yes, you're right, Merry Christmas. I, is I that, think is that what we're trying to accomplish? It, it just felt it felt like a turf war, like a pr- protecting your turf. And again, I was like v- very much on board for Jesus is the reason for the season because like, it rhymes. It, it looks great in a store window. Yeah, we uh, a couple of months ago we were we were driving past this. Uh, all my family was in the car, and we drove past. Uh, it, I guess it was October, and uh, an automobile lot. And you know they got the showroom with like the big glass windows, and they paint all their windshields with prices. But they painted their showroom windows huge across all the windows. Like if you if you had to really take the time to 
to, to, to back up or really take in the whole thing, across the whole thing, it said, Jesus is the reason for the season. And then it was October, they had never taken it down. <laughs> so I'm like, well, well, kids, you know what? It's fall. Jesus is the Jesus reason, is for, the the reason for fall. And technically, and that's true. Hey, you know, well, in, I mean, from that perspective. So yeah, so we didn't really get in on that bandwagon, and to me, it felt silly uh, when I when I saw Christians getting really concerned about that particular issue. Even though, for us personally, Jesus was absolutely the center of of Christmas, which was the main holiday that, that we were personally celebrating. Yeah, and well, in the way that I related but there to- were, uh, there are other holidays that are happening around then that other people celebrate, uh, you know? So to say happy holidays, just to acknowledge that other people are celebrating other holidays is, is not a bad thing. That's just called being considerate. Right, it seems very Christian, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I just never got that. I'm, I'm glad. I mean, there's lots of things I'm like, I wish I would have done it differently, but I never, I never fought that fight. Yeah. But the thing that I never insisted that somebody else celebrate something that I'm celebrating. Right, right. But the thing that I can relate to when it comes to this, uh, maybe holding Christmas in a precious way is the secular treatment of, of Christmas just traditionally, right? So you've got, um, like okay, you've got Charles Dickens as an example, right? So you, you've got a Christmas Carol, or any really anything that centers around the spirit of Christmas as it relates to anything other than Jesus. So you've got Santa and gift giving, and well, gift giving. You could, not, say, you could say that the tree. Some people say the tree is pagan. Some people say the tree is Christian. Some can, people say you can com, you can commandeer all these things for your in, your your individual purposes. But what I'm saying is that like I'm not saying I wasn't one of these anti Santa uh, Christians either, and, and not in like a Santa is just Satan rearranged in the same letters, mm -hmm. right? Like there are Christians who think that and think that Santa is this secular distraction. I didn't think that either, but what I did think is when I would see a Christmas movie, let's say Elf as an example, best your favorite movie, movie. Best movie ever. I could appreciate how awesome of a movie it is, not necessarily my favorite or even in my top 10, but a very solid Christmas movie. I could appreciate it and appreciate uh, all the good principles that it kind of uh, that it reinforced in the spirit of Christmas, but as a Christian, I would kind of stand aside and say, "Yeah, that's a real nice story, but you guys do know that Jesus is the reason for the season. That the whole point of this holiday is to celebrate the fact that God became a human, came down on our level, and gave us a way to be reconciled to Him. You do understand that's what's it about. Well, and it's one thing to imply it in all of the the, the Hollywood Christmas movies, but I mean. It, and a lot of times it's blatantly stated that you know the reason for the season or they may put it in different terms but they'll blatantly say that like the spirit of christmas is family it's it's like good tidings right it's just you know it's it's i'll be home for christmas it's getting together it's just it it's that type of stuff and I didn't want people to change their movies. I, was, I wasn't thinking like, you know, Elf would have been a whole lot better if like, you know, if the, what's the Elf's name? You should know this. Will Ferrell. Well, what's his name in the Buddy. movie? Buddy. If Buddy would have become a Christian during the movie. <laughs> like, I'm not talking about like, I'm, I'm not saying I wanna have like Kirk Cameron type movies. Yeah, I wasn't into that either. No, 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 we hated those. <laughs> we, we hated, hated those. those movies. We hated movies that were explicitly Christian and had, but but because they weren't artful. Yeah, most because most, again, it felt it. like it was for the it was for the audience. It, but anyway, um, or it was preaching to the choir, whatever. But I still had this sort of judgment in my mind that was like, yeah, you guys almost get it, but you don't really get it. You've created all this uh, holiday accoutrement around. Christmas in order to make it seem meaningful, but you've missed the heart of it, which is this is about Jesus, y'all. And so it's all pointless. It ultimately, you know, if you're gonna miss the heart of it, then all the stuff around it really doesn't mean anything. I was very sensitive to putting my values and ex and expectations onto other people that I didn't think I had any realistic expectation that that, that they would be interested in that. Um, but I'll tell you what I did do. Yeah, yeah, I mean, as a kid, 
our our evangelical upbringing was like the the center point of our identity. I mean, and then uh, I I think for me there had to be like a looking down my nose at other people, or just or maybe feeling sorry for people who are just missing like the 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 real the real point of what needs to be celebrated at Christmas and what I'm experiencing is celebrating. It was more you know, of a bless their hearts there was, kind of thing. There was, yeah, there was a depth in in the experience that I was having that I felt like by comparison, like from the from my evangelical perspective looking at other people, just thinking okay, it's just a bit, it's a bit shallow. Yeah, I mean like family and, and love and service and all, all these good things are, they're very meaningful things, but they're not as meaningful as God coming to earth, humbling himself as a baby. Like that, that that's tremendously inspirational and, um, and, and a lot of other things. And then when, when Christy and I got married and we, we started having kids, it's like, okay, now is my opportunity to, you know, I'm in charge of, creating new traditions and finding the ways that we're gonna keep Jesus at the center of, 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 of our focus. And I, so one of the things we did is we would, we, we made up our mind that we were gonna always tell our kids that, and maybe we need to put a spoiler alert on this, but I don't, you know what I'm about to say. If there's somebody <laughs> listening that you don't wanna, you don't want to know certain things that about the about the man, uh, the secular man of Christmas. Yeah, <laughs> we're going to reveal the truth about the secular man of Christmas. So if you have little ones who are listening in on this conversation, <laughs> and you want the miracle of Christmas to remain alive, tune out right now. This this what's happening right here was never a problem for me because I decided. Uh huh. I think this was a link decision. It's like you know what, our kids are always going to know that Santa is just is fake. But we're still going to have there's we're still going to surprise them with presents on Christmas morning that weren't wrapped and under the tree. There's going to be some unwrapped stuff that's going to be there when they run down the stairs, and you know I still want to have that scene because mm -hmm. that's it's so exciting, and I don't want to take that away entirely. But when the weatherman is like, "We've spotted Santa on the radar," yeah, my, you're like, Kids, my that's BS." When Lily's five years old, she 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 never thought. There was never a point where she thought, and she knew that she wasn't supposed to tell other kids. And unlike you, who told me way too late in my experience that Santa Claus was fake, uh, she did not do that to her friends. Well, the, at a young the age. funny thing about this is that I never made a decision one way or the other. Uh, I always, you know, me, I like uh, making things up and making my kids believe things that aren't true, just for my own personal entertainment, and. Um, so Santa, it fits the bill there, right? And so mm -hmm. we would. Your Santa probably was real crazy. Well, the thing is, like, is got, that he's got three eyes, but one of them has an eye patch. But think about my kids, though. My kids are just like me, and it, I didn't. You know, the reason I didn't think Santa was real when I was a kid wasn't because an adult told me. It was because you're saying you're smarter than me as a kid. Well, no, I just th I think about things in a different way. Let's just say that I was like, this can't be real. And I so, embrace the wonder of and joy of life, and so and I don't question. My it. kids did the exact same thing. There was never a moment where I had to break a truth to them. It was more just like at some point in an early age, they were just like, I know Santa's not real. I know you're giving me these gifts. I had made it, but it's fun to play along. I had made a decision to actually proactively tell them and like burst the bubble before it would hurt too bad. And, because, and the reason why, I actually felt really good about saying this is a protection from, even for my kids at their youngest age, I'm, I'm removing some of the temptation to focus on the wrong thing. It's like, remember, we're, we're focusing on Jesus here. We can have the presence and we're, you know, the reason why we have the presence is because uh, presents were brought to Jesus because people knew that he was, he was God incarnate and they were they came to worship him as a king and they gave him gifts. And so, you know, you just try to couch everything w through the lens of Jesus, right? That's a Christmas movie for Kirk Cameron to make. <laughs> right, through the lens of Jesus. Uh, and I felt good about that. N now, 
you know, well, and I don't feel bad about it now, but I just, you know, I was a, I was kind of a stickler, and but I remember feeling like this is something tangible that I've done that impacts my family's ability to focus on what matters most. Well, and some and people, I think that that's that's that was my role. And some people might say just another reason if you if this is your perspective, uh, another reason to clarify the fact that Santa is a made up thing is because you don't want it to be like, all right, there's two things that are true, child. Uh, Jesus is God's son and God in the flesh, this Christmas story. But also there's this dude named St. Nicholas who comes and flies around hauled by reindeer and gives you presents. Flying reindeer and, and comes down your And at some point, chimney. I'm gonna break the news to you that one of these t- two things is not real. And the way I'm gonna <laughs> do it is by saying, one of these is not real, you choose. Right, no, yeah. <laughs> no, it, but you don't. Yeah, and so it, it, for I think for some Christians, it's like, hey, let's just, let, let's tell our kids the truth, and again, this is the truth according to a Christian, um, that hey, this story is real, and this story is sort of the secular cultural story that we tell ourselves. That's a fairy tale, like the like the uh, tooth fairy, whatever Easter Bunny, you know. I, I they never believe the Easter Bunny or the tooth fairy really either for the for kind of the same reason. Easter I, Bunny, I had this, Easter I had Bunny this is a principled thing that was like, you know what? I don't want I don't want to have to break it to my kids that I was lying to them. But I don't know that that's how kids but process I, it. And but. I, I never went there because a lot of my kids all the time. But the Easter Bunny is the worst holiday mascot because what does the Easter Bunny do? I mean, the Tooth Fairy has a very specific thing. It's a transactional relationship. You, you know, you give him the tooth, he gives you money. I understand how that works. I know when it happens. Are you picturing happen- the rock or something? You're uh, saying he. Well, I'm saying he because I played the Tooth Fairy in uh, oh. a, a very, a video I'm very proud of. Do you remember that video that we made? I can't remember what it's called. Spot the differences. Spot the differences. Whatever. Uh, but the Easter Bunny. The, no one says, "Hey, let's go outside and find the eggs that the Easter Bunny hid." E- we even we do away with that mirage. We say, "No, the parents are going outside." At what? What is the role of the Easter Bunny? Uh, I think to be eating his chocolate. I don't know. Yeah, it's a it's a weak ass weak ass holiday mascot. I will say. There was another factor in saying that Santa Claus wasn't real, but they still got the gifts. Is because then I could take full credit for all of the gifts. I understand. I that. think that was an ulterior motive on my on my behalf. But yeah, there was there was this. I mean, I was. We, we had so many family to visit that we didn't go to the Christmas Eve service. We didn't actually have a lot of like Christmas time traditions, um, but. We did have some, like we would read, we would read, like from the children's Bible, like the Christmas story, from a young age. Um, I've got this video of Lily. Um, before she could read, she we, we had we had read it to her so much that she had memorized the Christmas story based on this children's picture book, and it was it's the cutest thing because she would act like she's reading, but she just memorized everything that we said per page. And it, you know, it felt good to know that one of the first things she memorized was the story of of Jesus humbling himself and coming to earth in order to be her savior. And you know, it's I it, I just felt like I was do, okay. I was like, this is this is my job as dad, and Chrissy's job as mom is is to instill this knowledge in. In her, at at a young age, to to where she knows that God loves her, and cares about her, and went to great lengths to to not only demonstrate that, but to make that to make that relationship possible, you know. So it felt really good, and it was it was validating that, you know, we've got this system, I've got this belief system that I'm I'm all in with, and I'm very. Th- Every benefit associated with it, like I was, I felt like I was, I, at the time that I was only experiencing the benefits. You know, I think I've processed in my other story that like there's there's another side to it for for me. But um, at Christmas time, it felt good. It's like okay, we're not losing sight of the point. Yeah. Um. We most of our most of our uh, touch points related to church. You know, we were very involved. In our in our church, you were very involved in your church as well. But during Christmas, we were very involved in church, including like the you know being involved in the program 
uh, to the point where every year Jesus, uh, Jesus, Jesse, my wife would put, would play Mary in this like play where, and I think maybe for the first year she did it or one year she did it that one like Locke was Jesus, but other years it was other people's babies, like a real baby. She would sing. Huh. Like, you know, she's like this one woman show as Mary. And you would you'd like candles and it would be a it would the be Advent, a big moment. You know, and then and then there was that album, that dude, what is his name? Is it uh I'm gonna is it Andrew Peterson? Is that his name? I don't know if that's the I, I don't know. I don't know if the there's this guy, you, you know, he he uh this the it's the Christian musician who came out with the album that has become the all the songs that Christians play. Uh, it's been like fifteen years ago. And it's just like, um, it's not Mary Did You Know, that's the old school. It, this is like, it's the one about like Mary in the, it, the whole album is a Christmas album and it's the one where like all the things that people sing at evangelical churches come from. And I think the dude's name is Peterson. You know these songs for 100% sure it's just you were a music leader at your church. You just didn't maybe not make the connection to the album. I wasn't that hip. Um, I assume they're still, I know they're still playing them because when I went to a Christmas Eve service at my old church like two years ago, it's still playing the but same what is song. But what is your point? I'm just saying that, uh, that was just a, just a complete sidebar, but my point is is that all our touch points were related to like the Christmas Eve service and um, the things leading up to uh, Christmas that we did as a church and it was all very meaningful and it was all very personal and impactful and our, we, our, we were involved as a family. Um, but let's move on to stage two, right? Because as we've established, uh, that mentality uh, and that approach did not continue. For me, you know, I struggled with doubt pretty much my entire adult life as it related to my Christian faith. But uh, you know, probably about fifteen years ago or so was when the doubts began to get uh, kind of crippling to the point that engaging in like Bible reading as an example, would inflame my doubts, right? So if I would go to the Bible to have my doubts addressed, some of the other things that I had read about these particular things would enter my mind and it became this thing where the more sensational the story, the more difficult it was for me to believe. And I feel like the Christmas story kind of brings together a lot of different elements, right? So you've got some things that are, let's just be honest, difficult to believe, virgin birth, the idea that there's a star that is settling over the town of Bethlehem that is leading the wise men to the town, which seems to indicate that the, 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 the authors didn't really understand the nature of stars and how far away they actually are and how that's not how stars work. Um, or maybe it was a special star that was just happened for this. I, I Listen, I'm, everything that I'm gonna say right now, which is where it, it, sort of like my doubts that I have about the story, I am well aware that, uh, there are plenty of evangelical, traditional Christian explanations for all these things. I'm not discounting those, I'm just saying that for me, when I engage with the Christmas story from a historical perspective and some of the issues that there are there, you know, related to like this, the, the Herod and the governor of Syria, Quirinius, or the census and these things that like you can kind of call into question from a historical perspective and the way that they line up, or the fact that the the Christmas story, the nativity story is kind of added to, um, you know, Luke and Matthew, but it's not in the earliest gospel, the, the book of Mark. So it kind of lends itself to this idea that the legend of Jesus was growing as time went by and so they were adding things like, hey, we got let's add this story that shows how he fulfilled prophecy. Again, this is the secular view of these things. Um, and I began to see some of those answers and some of those explanations to those difficult passages less as a good answer and more as what felt like this is, seems more desperate, right? This does, it's not satisfying to me. And so when I would engage with the story, I would be thinking about all those things. It's like, I'm thinking about the, the critical view of this story, which is not a fun way to engage with a story, right? Mm. And so Christmas became a time where I was kind of of two minds, right? There was some serious cognitive dissonance going on because there was a real appreciation for the idea of Christmas and the idea that God would become one of us 
and would make that connection in a way that I had not seen demonstrated in any other faith system, right? Um, and there was all the stuff that went along with it and those songs that we sang from that album that I can't remember, um, they were incredibly meaningful. Even in the middle of my severe doubt about these things, when I would read the story and these doubts would be inflamed, I could still move on to singing the song, singing the hymns, thinking about Jesus, uh, and it would be very moving and very impactful. But it, there was a, a few, a good number of years there where the doubts were so strong that engaging with the story of Christmas was a bit of a train wreck inside my my mind. Yeah, I um, I, I can understand what you're saying. I think in my process, Christmas didn't bring up as much, but uh, it didn't. You know, it wasn't as difficult because there was more like the traditions that we had and the amount of family we had to visit. It was easier to get distracted, and I felt like. I tended to focus on the expectations I'd placed on myself to make sure that like we were we're remembering that Jesus is the center of this and we're doing some things and we do have some we do we have the advent calendar and we have traditions that we're doing with the kids um but it was easy personally I think as there were starting to be doubts for it, it for me just to go into distraction mode because there was so much else going on anyway uh in terms of gifts and family and food and everything else that is the secular reasons for the season that everybody falls back on. Right. Um, I, I definitely remember you talking about albums. A at a certain point when I was, I mean our conversations were pretty constant and so my, you know, I was more resistant at first because I didn't want to shake things up but as, as I started to come to grips with my own doubts and my own experience, I remember at Christmas time I would, I would listen to Sufjan Stevens' Christmas albums. Like for a couple of years, he would release one every year. So there's like this four disc box set that as a family, it's still very much a tradition for us to listen. This is the album that's playing in our house constantly. And um, I would recommend getting it if you're a fan of Sufjan's earlier stuff. His stuff now, I can't get it's, into it. it's like, I try, I try to get. Into I don't know what recent. you need to be under the influence of, but well, it just went. It went. Uh, it's very electronic. It went electronic, and I'm just not into that. So this like acoustic, homemade. It feels like four track in his own house, like playing horns and having people who can't sing start to sing along with him, and like yeah, it was awesome. Uh, it it's really awesome. But I remember like thinking, okay, if. Sufyan, he's a he's singing these Christmas songs because he, you know he's he's got a Christian faith. Like I don't know his story, but like he's got this faith in Jesus, and you know I, I don't know I'm not going to put a label on him. I don't know what label he applies to himself, if any, or how that's changed over the years. But you know he made he he released meaningful Christmas music that was that was meaningful to me, and I thought this guy, you know I he. He seems really progressive. He's an artist. He's cool. It's like I think maybe this is my future. This is maybe maybe there's something in his relationship with Christmas and with Jesus hmm. that like I could be like I could take a cue from Sufjan Stevens. You know, it's uh, it's it's well, it's interesting. It's like I don't. I'm not going to read as many books as you. I'm just going to start listening to this guy and start saying if he. Can. Well, you know the thing about music though. I think this is an interesting point. Uh, and I agree with it, and it's and it and relate to it personally because music kind of transcends um, the intellectual doubts that you might have, you know. And you're dealing with the stuff that's kind of up here in your your headspace, and is this a rational sort of battle that's happening? You know, music it can connects with your soul in, in in a different way, that, and this is why I can still listen e even today. I don't consider myself a Christian. I can listen to, uh, you know, "Be Thou My Vision," one of my favorite hymns, and t tear, cry. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, so I, I, yeah, there's something that transcends that mental barrier in, in music, anyway. So I think that was, and I think it keeps, honestly, it keeps people around for longer. You know, there's something about, uh, there's something about just singing together. I mean. It, what other venue do you have in your life where you go 
and you get together with a bunch of like-minded people and you sing songs that are just the most passionate things you could possibly imagine. I mean, that doesn't happen. Christians got that one down pretty good. Um, you know, I mean, we, the, the closest thing that I can think of is when we went to, a, to our friend's house and we did the sing-along um, last year, you know, did you, oh, you didn't even come to that. You, mm -hmm. you guys didn't come. Oh, well, you totally missed out, man. Thank you. Um, but like we just sang, we, it was like singing together. I was like, man, singing. That was a Thanksgiving thing, I think. Singing together with other people, it's just something that should happen in more places, you know? But anyway, I digress. So, th so there was there was that um, that period where there was that cognitive dissonance happening, and it was just like I can't engage with this, but I love my family, and I still love God, and I'm trying to figure all this stuff out. Um, and then there was again, I I told all this story. I don't remember the exact year. It was more. It was after we moved out here it, when it became like official, but still more than several years ago. Where I was like, okay, it's official. I don't, I don't believe this anymore. Like I, I just, I'm, I cannot, mm -hmm. I cannot honestly call myself a Christian. I'm not going to pursue this. I'm not going to engage with this. I'm not going to go to church anymore. You know, it wasn't that clean, but there was a point in which that was who I became. But you still got Christmas rolling around every single year, right? And it's weird. It's weird when you have like, hey, we've been doing this every year and it's been just saturated in meaning. It's been saturated in the most uh, sort of consequential and important meaning that it could possibly have. And now you're just gonna become one of those guys that's just getting through the Christmas season on some good tidings from the Christmas movies, for somebody who's had a really deep spiritual experience, um, those Christmas movies, again, Elf, great movie, doesn't cut it. It, it, it. If you've had that depth of experience. Yeah, God is not a character. <laughs> Will Ferrell is awesome, but he is not God. And so it's like you come to that time and there's this like, man, the depth of experience in the depth that this that this had associated with it that permeated my life personally but also permeated the lives of my wives and children why wives and children, watch out man. my wife and children our family that's an easier way to say it it's not there yeah how I do think, you engage with that i think about the realization that that children's book that we had you know, it's like one 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 year you pull down the Christmas decorations and the Christmas books and like that book that Lily memorized that you read with Lincoln some when he was younger. Um, that like you realize that like it's you can't find it in the box anymore, or I don't remember ever deciding to not pull it out of the box or not to read it to Lando. But it's like, yeah, it's just kind of like you realize, you know what. I, Lando never read this book or, you know, and I remember, I, I think I do remember Christy finding it and reading it to Lando at a young age and it was like, it wasn't this communal experience that it was before because we were in this transitional time and again, it just, it kind of, the Christmas season brought it into focus and, you know, part of it is, well, you look at all the other, there's still a lot to be distracted by and we're still, you know, we're still going home for Christmas and you know, th yeah. there's a lot of logistics involved and it was once we moved out here. So it, 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 it didn't feel like this painful moment. It was just like all of a sudden you realize that book's not coming out of the box anymore, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I do think for me and that, Still, even now, like I'm, I'm at a different phase than I was. That was like everything seemed to be changing much more rapidly in terms of my worldview and my my belief paradigm and my allegiance to the evangelical worldview. You know that you get to a point. It's like you come to grips with that's not that's not me anymore, and it's not changing as fast, but there's still this residual in the back of my mind, I think, 
um, I, I I guess I would just call it there's there's a, there's an experience of guilt. It's like because there's this question. It's like when you let, as you put it in in your story, you you jump ship, you let go of something, but you don't have anything specific to grasp onto. It's like I'm not. We're not now, you know, as, ascribing to some other religious belief system. Well, and I and it, and, it, and and but so. I, I do think for for me, there is a bit of yeah. It's like oh, did we did I make the right decision? Did we, did we as a family make a right decision? You know, it's like there's these little questions. It's like I you know, I've tried my my best to embrace uncertainty as as a positive, but there's still moments of struggle, and I think it 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 happens more. Around the holidays, when you realize that like something that was extremely meaningful um, and a practice that you have with your with your first child is not part of what happens with your third child, and are are they missing out? You know, is is you know have we done them a disservice? And then I have to I I kind of have to rederive what brought what brought me to this point, and also look at our children and how tremendously fabulous they are and how proud I am of them and start to just have this reality check that like, okay, these feelings of guilt uh, or obligation, sometimes I, w- I, I think I, I would describe it as I'm feeling judged by my former self uh, because the position I'm in now and the way that I interact with Christmas um, is something that, again, I said earlier, I would feel I'd feel sorry for people that they didn't have the death of experience that I have, and now I'm in that position. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean, I definitely relate to that. I mean, I don't, uh, guilt is not really my, that's not my thing as much. Oh, it's my thing. But there is a. Um, I and think, I'm not blaming it all on evangelicalism either. It's, it's a link thing, not, it, yeah. it, it wasn't created by, the church, it was just how. Exacerbated by it. Uh, yeah. I, I think that the, really what you're getting at is you're, you're, one of the things you're doing is you're highlighting the importance of religion, right? You're, in, you're, you're highlighting the importance of a spiritual life. And so, uh, because if that meaning is to be had from something, if you can, if you can find that meaning and that purpose in something, well, that's one of the reasons that it, religion exists. That's one of the really. That's the main reason that people stick around for it, even if they don't quite believe it in full. Right? If they have some doubts, they're like, "But the alternative is just I don't believe anything." And I do. Interesting that you bring up that that quote from my deconstruction story, where I talked about jumping ship, and it was a very dramatic line, and it has been played in many different videos that critiqued our construction deconstruction stories. Um, there's a there's a one of my favorites is, is one uh, speaking of Kirk Cameron by Mr. Ray Comfort who works with uh, who who works with Kirk and um, he kind of goes through and 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 breaks down our story and plays some very sentimental music and almost some like music that's sort of like impending doom the whole time as we tell our stories and uh, a lot many things are taken out of context it's very entertaining but. Um, one of the things is that line about I jumped ship and I took my wife and my children with me and it's just like that people quote like, it's so sad he took his wife and his children with me. I think I regret saying, that it, was, it was a little bit of a dramatic thing to say. I regret saying it because it, I think the, the better analogy is I jumped out of a ship and there's not another ship like that uh, that you're jumping into, right? But it doesn't mean that you've, that you there you have no meaning you have no purpose and you have no principles in your life those those things are still intact the it doesn't source mean and that the found- you're drying you're drowning yeah the source and the philosophical foundation of those things is coming from a different place and it may be a place that you as a christian philosopher may say is you know illegitimate i would disagree i'm just saying that like it isn't like i've been swimming in this ocean of uncertainty and my family's going nuts it's like but that's how it was interpreted but I do, I mean, I agree with what you're saying in in the sense that it's like, all right, you approach this and there's, there's, there's the puzzle pieces are in place. 
Like every time you come around to Christmas, it's just like we have a puzzle, we know where the pieces go, we can tell our kids this is how it works. And then all of a sudden, you come to the you come to the holiday and it's like the puzzle doesn't can't fit together in a very satisfying way anymore. Yeah, and the, so the you central don't... the central assertion was don't forget what matters most. Yeah. That was that was our experience in phase one. Yeah. And then in in the in the doubting phase, well now we're we're talking about phase three now. We're still in phase three. Okay. Phase three of you know what? That I, I haven't replaced that matters most with something else specifically, but we're still, you know, we're just getting through this. And uh, honestly, well, I'm not suffering. My family's not suffering. We're not, um, it, it's not a horrible experience. But you're hearing the echoes of the e old I'm link hearing saying, echoes. Yes. There is no meaning here. This is pointless. You know, the things that we would have thought about people yes. who weren't Christians before when we were Christians. And you find yourself in it and you're like, man, I, you know, like, I still really love my wife. I still really love my family. I, I, we stand for very similar things. We're not different people, but we don't but know how to reconcile this story in the same way. And so you find yourself becoming the secular person that you felt sorry for, and you're like, I get it's about I'm, the food, the I, decorations. I'm getting through Christmas on the accoutrement, service, and and family, and. Love. But in an effort to transition into stage four, which is, uh, which I don't like saying stage four because it sounds like cancer, uh, uh, you know, uh, phase four. Um, I actually personally, again, this is not prescriptive. I'm not saying this for anybody else. This is for me. I actually do find phase three to be inadequate for me personally. So the idea that Christmas is just about those things, just about the give, the giving and the receiving and the uh, the good tidings and great joy unrelated to Jesus, just the secular side of things, just watching Elf or seeing Tim Allen be Santa again. I do find those things to be inadequate. Like I don't, I didn't want to be stuck at phase three. In other words, I didn't want to become a completely uh, non-spiritual person who was like, that's all just mumbo jumbo and I'm gonna just build my life on rationality completely and it's just a natural existence and that's it and that's, and now people, lots of people have done that, more power to you if that works for you. For me. And by the way, people have converted to other religions and then they have, this, so then they have new holidays that they don't have to, to come to grips with Christmas on other terms, they have other holidays that are in place of it that have depth of meaning that but, are. But they're not as good as Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but you know, something interesting has happened to me. Um, and I think, I mean, it's been happening over the past few years. This is not super new, but when we broke the seal earlier this year, Boy, when we were telling those stories about our deconstruction, we had no idea what the hell 2020 was gonna bring. We had no idea that people were gonna no longer care about our deconstruction story as soon as they found out about COVID-19. Maybe it was a blessing. I think it was a blessing. From that perspective. It's not a blessing for the world by any means. Um, but we had a really interesting, I'm using the word interesting a lot and I hate the word interesting so I apologize. Um, we had a unique perspective um, on the way that we would approach our past faith for the bulk of our career, right? We're kind of a sh like a little bit embarrassment about how serious we were and how far we went in and the fact that we were missionaries. I mean, not necessarily embarrassment, but like this is gonna be difficult to explain and I'm gonna have to say where I'm at now. And so there was almost an avoidance, a secrecy I'm sure some of you who've been fans for a long time could sense that, they're like, oh, they don't talk about their past. And I think that it actually influenced the way that I dealt with it personally. It, it, it inhibited my own personal freedom to explore spiritual things because I had such a weird relationship with it and I was this public figure that had this past that I kind of couldn't explain and didn't wanna go into the details of, but when we made the decision, 
to tell the story in its entirety without apology, it broke a seal for me personally. And it what it did is it kinda, I, it was like something within me got the okay to be like, all right, you can move on now. You don't have to be in this place that's just a guy who used to be a Christian and doesn't believe that stuff anymore and that's who you are. You can actually move forward to whatever's next for you from a spiritual perspective. And one of the things that has happened, and this is, I don't know where, I don't know exactly where it's all going spiritually for me, but I said him when I told my story that I had an openness, and I did. I have an openness. I did, and I ha- and I do currently have an openness towards um, spiritual things. And one of the interesting things that interesting again, one of the things that has happened is sort of a reengaging with the person of Jesus in a completely different way. And that is, you know, I used to think about. Anything that, if I go to the Bible and I would read something that Jesus said, again, I was sort of overwhelmed with, well, let me, let, let's bring in the critical lens. Let's bring in the perspective of the Jesus seminar onto this text. That's not a fun way to interact with Jesus, right? <laughs> or a particularly useful way, personally, when it comes to like your own personal edification. There's been a couple of int- good books that I, I've read this year that I'm not gonna go into but have sort of changed my perspective on how I can engage with Jesus. Not as someone who is the you know, is God in the flesh that is the only way to be reconciled with a vengeful God who who has to punish somebody, you know. The I I'm not holding on to any of the uh, any to the old, the old stuff. But just looking at what Jesus said and did as a spiritual teacher and being like there's there's a lot there, right? Uh, and even engaging in the story, uh, the Christmas story, not with a preoccupation about whether or not it's historically true or, or based in fact, but is there truth there to be gleaned? Is there something that you and your family can actually get from interacting with it, taking it at face value without getting into this game of trying to figure out whether it's real or not, which is a little bit ironic because if you think about the stories that Jesus, I mean, first of all, Jesus taught in parable, right? He taught in story, he told stories, he made analogies. And the fact that no one is ever recorded in the Bible as responding to one of the stories that he told with, uh, 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 but did that really happen? Okay, yeah. No one was like, oh, but hold on, hold on. This thing with the Samaritan, did, did did that really happen? Did it happen last week? Did you see it happen? Because if you didn't see it happen, I don't believe it. His point was, is that truth is not, I think, I, truth is not something that is just contained in this factually, historical, um, verifiable, vessel, right? Truth comes in a lot of different forms. And I can listen to, I can I can watch a movie, right? I can watch a movie that is from beginning to end fiction and still find truth in it. And I'm not, listen, I'm not saying, okay, the only way I can engage with the Christmas story is by just saying it's a fairy tale and that's it. But I'm saying that if I quit, if I turn that part of my brain off that is just constantly trying to judge whether or not Jesus actually said this or whether or not this actually happened, whether or not somebody was a virgin and got pregnant. And I'm just like, let's set those things aside because I'm not gonna reconcile those things. I, I mean, I have a very strong opinion about some of those things and some very strong doubts, but is there a story to be heard there? Is there a lesson to be learned there? Is there truth within this? Um, and I think that that is, very freeing for me personally. Does that translate into like something going in a stocking? I mean, what practice, is there a, is there a practical application? There doesn't have to be for like Christmas and, and, and maybe this is, maybe my question is revealing about my own issue which I can get into but, so maybe it's not a fair question. But. 
Hey, do you even think about it that way? Like, no. So, so that's are, not are, really what I'm. Are, are you saying for at Christmas time you're reflecting on the story, but you're you're doing it in a way that it can be edifying to you. Your interaction with Jesus can be edifying for you, as opposed to it being something that's, you're trying to judge or tear something down. Yeah, that. because because you're either you're either not going to interact with Jesus at Christmas time. Or you're going to have a, a a negative interaction, or now you're trying to say I'm I'm going to have the positive interaction that I'm able to have, and I I'm actually I've I'm at a point where I can have that, right? And that's what I'm going to have. And well, and I think some people would say, guys, this is where this is this is where the Enlightenment screwed things up because if you go back to pre Enlightenment in pre sort of modern thinking about things and pre rational thought about things. Uh, this is how people engaged with the stories of Jesus. There was not a preoccupation with whether or not these things happen or not. It wasn't, it, there wasn't this tendency to want to verify and completely wrap your mind around these things, but there was a spiritual interaction with them. And there, and I believe that there are still many Christians who would say, hey guys, this is, this is what my faith looks like right now. Yeah. Um, I, I guess it's, it, the, my old mindset creeps in because it's like, you know, the way I interacted with it was God became human in order to save us from ourselves. Well, even that, okay. And so it's right. So when we look at the story of Christmas uh, from a Christian perspective, um, you're right. It's God emptying himself, becoming a baby. Again, I don't know how this works. Um, I don't actually believe that's what was happening, but according to the story, becomes becomes a baby, becomes sort of the the complete 100% God, 100% human, that then is the only sacrifice that can be made in order to reconcile everyone who will call on the name of the Lord to God, right? But isn't there a different way to, isn't there something else to appreciate without have, that having to be true, right? For instance, because since you mentioned this exact thing, because I was thinking about this earlier, I don't know the nature of God. I don't necessarily know anyone can understand, grasp, or know, or talk about in a in a understandable way the nature of God. I think that there are, if there is a God, um, there's probably an experience of that God is is somewhat ineffable, meaning you cannot communicate it in a way that would make sense because it's happening in a different place on a different level in a different way than human language can express. But the idea that God would want to be so close and so involved in so much a part of humanity that he would become one of us is a beautiful concept that makes me think about the nature of God in an open and edifying way. Does that make sense? It doesn't have to have happened as described for me to be like that in the way, I'm glad we talked about music. It wasn't that I didn't know this was gonna happen, but a song resonates with you. It's there's something about- On a soul level. There's something about music that you connect with and you wouldn't say that song is true and that song is false, but you would be like, this song, I feel like I begin to actually resonate and synchronize with this music because it connects with my soul and this doesn't. I feel like that can happen with a story as well. And so for me, there are elements of that idea because I mean, if anything, if there, if the, the concept of God being in everything and God being available within someone and the idea, and, you know, the universe, the fabric of the universe, being whatever you wanna call it, that's something that's still very intriguing to me that I wanna be open to and I wanna lean into and I feel like I can find that in the story of Christmas. That's all I'm saying. I, I think our former selves would be saying right now, I mean, you just can't, you, you can't invent, you, you can't just invent the terms with which you interact with Jesus. I mean, you're missing, you know, it's, you're kind of, you're missing the point. You, you're just inventing, a new way to interact with Jesus that is just picking and choosing what you want that's gonna be inspirational for you. I think that's what I, what our former selves would have said. Of course that's what said. I would have said. Um, but I don't think, 
And it it doesn't matter what anybody's saying. I think f- for you, you're making a decision because I, I do think the decision has been, is is there gonna be any interaction with Jesus? You know? Or am I just gonna move on and, and say that was in my past? You know, having, being spiritually open, I, th- I think is, I, I hear, you, that's what I see in, in what you're saying that like you're, you're choosing to, uh, to approach Jesus in a way that you can. And ha- who is anybody to argue with that even if they think you may be missing the point or doing it wrong. Well, you know, it's- think about Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Let's keep going with this music thing. I'm really glad you brought it up because I don't know if you've seen the movie. Seen the movie? I've heard about it. Um, I've seen images from it. So the way that they communicate with the alien beings is in the form of music because music, again, represents this ineffable thing that's happening on a different level of consciousness uh, that the language barrier between whatever they would speak and whatever we would speak can, can't, but there, we find music and that's how we communicate, right? I think that's a beautiful picture because I do wanna address the criticism that the, our former selves would make. Of course, my former self would be like, dude, you're just a new age bullshitter that just does whatever, thinks whatever he wants to. And there's there is absolutely nothing that I can say to convince that per, who, per person who thinks that, that that's not what's happening. But what I would tell my former, former self is that I think that there is a preoccupation with categorizing and systematizing the deepest truths of the universe in a way to make them understandable and applicable. And there is some merit in that. But what I'm trying to be open to is the idea that whatever God is can be something that I can experience without having to turn around and explain it and categorize it and be able to recreate it and package it and write it down and speak it to someone else. And I think that, um, ironically, I think that some of the things that Jesus said when you when you kind of come to some of the things that he said from a fresh perspective seem to indicate that he was hinting at some of those things along with a lot of other religious leaders who've, who've lived and said similar things, the Buddha being one. Ultimately what I'm saying is I have found it to be especially free, <clears throat> freeing to take that uh, post-enlightenment, human has to figure everything out hat off and be like, what is it like to engage with God in the way that I would engage with the ocean? You know, I don't go into the ocean and ride a wave and preoccupy myself with the physics of what's happening, I just do it, I just experience it, right? And I think if there is a God, that God is probably like that. And so when I think about the Christmas story, yes, it is something that somebody wrote down 2000 years ago. Yes, it is something that does get down into some uh, very particular truths about things. But what is it like to read a story that has that kind of significance and that kind of staying power and read it from a fresh perspective with taking that hat off? What kind of new things will you see? Well, one thing you'll see is, you know, okay, I'm looking at Mary and Joseph in a different way. I'm thinking about the fact that this is a pregnant woman who isn't married, who is seeking refuge How relevant is that in the world that we're in right now? That draws out my empathy, not only for them, but for people who might be currently in our world, in our society, dealing with the same things. And I don't have to just focus on the, but is this the son of God, period? Does that does that make sense? Yeah. I can find new things in it. Yeah, so I, you know, I, I definitely see how, as you described this phase for you, that it's it's how you're practically approaching the spiritual openness that that we both talked about at the end of our stories. 
You know, so I, you know, I I appreciate hearing it as it's food for thought for me. Um, as I continue to uh, to aim for spiritual openness myself, um, because that that is important to me. I think when when you describe your your tendency to want to judge the Bible uh, and like going against that tendency in order to move towards openness and um, you know a, a spiritual experience. Uh, for me, I think I think the task that I'm that I'm working with is it's it's judgment as well, but it's a it's a judgment of myself. Um, and I you know I'm I'm on a journey. It, that's I think that's where I'm at in my journey. I think a lot of it comes up at Christmas as I've alluded to that like it's it's uh, tr- trying to trying to move past self judgment because that's how th- that's you know that's how I that was my interaction a, a lot of my interaction with 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 how I came up, right? So it's 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 shedding that judgment so that I can actually have um, an an open and honest uh, spiritual pursuit. And I and you know I'll leave it at that at this point. But I think that that's uh, that's where I'm at. Yeah. I'm ve- you know again I'm I'm very grateful to be where I'm at. I'm very I'm happy to be on. This journey, I'm not. I'm not. I don't feel that I'm flailing or or struggling. I I don't have a tremendous amount of of. I'm not battling with doubt, you know. Just because those questions come up around Christmas time again, uh, I, I would not characterize it that way. But it's, you know, I. I'm constant. I I want to be answering the question and continuing to make positive progress in my in in my spiritual journey, um, and so part of that is is, is shedding this self judgment mm. and and understanding uh, when that comes into play and and kind of putting that in its place. Yeah, because it's not. I mean, it's not easy. It's not. E- I don't have the same exact hangups, but it's not easy for me, right? Because I feel like I stagnated for quite some time and it was it's weird that it took us talking about it for me to be like hey I can pick up a Richard Rohr book you know mm-hmm. and read it and know that you know we don't exactly agree on everything but the way he talks about Jesus is again it resonates and if I remove that 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 judgment that that okay well but I got to figure out how this lines up with this this system no, I don't. I don't have to figure that out. And who is God? <laughs> who am I to think that God has to be categorized or even understood? You know, and so I don't know. I don't I can't I can't turn around and tell you what in you being anyone listening what you should do because I can't tell me what I should do. It's a disposition, right? It's a le- it's a leaning and an openness more so than it is a, this is the prescribed path. And it just feels very different. And I'm sorry if when I get into it, when I the things I say don't make sense, but I kind of feel like that's the point, <laughs> right? The closer, the closer I get to it, the more I can't talk about it. Okay, well, and we don't have to talk about it anymore <laughs> right now. So, uh, I mean, if, if that's if that's your face, that's the face, that's it, then we've gone through them. Maybe there's another face. Who knows, man, phase five. Okay, let you us got know a what- recommendation? I do, uh, before we f- wrap that conversation up though, just let us know, uh, you know, your experience in where, whatever phase you're currently in. Uh, and how, Hashtag ear biscuits. How you think about Christmas and the holidays. I do have a rec, and I may have talked about this at some point, but the website that I use for a lot of my meat tips, oh. uh, amazingribs.com. Right, it's not really a left turn because it goes back to, I really wanna do like a standing rib roast. Ooh. Uh, 
because I think that's a great. Amazingrib.com, that's uh, Meathead. It's Meathead, Meathead Goldwyn, I guess is his name. And he, this dude is just the authority when it comes to barbecue. And again, it's amazing ribs because he started, I guess, with telling people how to make ribs, but it, it, it runs the gamut. You wanna know how to you know, smoke, bake, brine, a turkey, whatever. Any kind of piece of meat, you wanna know exactly how you should do it from a scientific standpoint. I mean, he get he has like a, uh, a chemist or somebody that he consults, like a local professor who huh. goes into the details of like, this is a myth, you don't need to do this, but you do need to do this, and here's why you need to do it. And so for someone who wants to appreciate sort of the technical side of making merry with meat, hmm. um, it's, it's a lifesaver, and he has incredible recipes, and I'm hoping to follow at least one of them for Christmas, and you will be the receiver of that bounty. Yes. AmazingRibs.com. <laughs> Merry we'll Christmas. We'll see you next week. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. To watch more Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist on the right. To watch the previous episode of Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist to the left. And don't forget to click on the circular icon to subscribe. If you prefer to listen to this podcast, it's available on all your favorite podcast platforms. Thanks for being your mythical best.